G'day trainers, welcome back. We are covering episode two of Pokemon Horizons, The Pendant of Beginnings, part two. So the first two episodes were released as a one hour special, but I didn't want to go in. I wanted to take it at episode by episode review because uh, they are still technically two separate episodes. Uh, number one was incredible. I cannot gush over this enough, and I, especially on stream, I haven't stopped talking to you guys about it. It feels like an anime. It is amazing. It is the some of the best Pokemon has ever been. These battles, the battle between, uh, we'll find out his name soon, uh, but this the, the mysterious savior, savior that swooped down in, uh, and the enemy, again, we find out his name as well in this episode, but the battle between their Charizard and Cerule Edge was insane. This episode kicks off exactly, like, split second as the first episode finishes. So we've got Liko and Sprigatito, they've leapt from a building, a bit in half, a psycho cut from Cerule Edge that was bit in half by Charizard is flying at them, and then all of a sudden, a giant... A giant circle of greenish energy surrounded Liko and Sprigatito right before they were sliced in half. And that's where this begins. We kicked off this episode with looking inside that energy bubble. Inside it is a crystal turtle. A crystal turtle Pokemon. It looks very, very reminiscent as to maybe it's going to be a pre-evolution of one of the new legendary Pokemon, Terrapagos. I will put a image up of Terrapagos. It's the uh, it's the Pokemon that's got to sit all 18 Pokemon type symbols on its shell that's going to be coming out with the Scarby DLC, the part two of that DLC. Um, so it looks like it's going to be related to that in some way. I'm thinking maybe it's not a legendary Pokemon. Maybe it'll be a uh, maybe it'll be more of a mythical sort of like a, a Fiona Manaphy situation. Because off the top of my head, I don't think we've got any legendary Pokemon that can evolve. No, 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 no. Mythicals, yes, uh, but not legendary. So maybe I'm trying to remember if they if they explicitly said Terrapagos is going to be a legendary Pokemon, and it might. We'll see. Um, but we kick off. Liko and Sprigatito are face to face with this Terrapagos lookalike turtle crystal Pokemon, uh, and nothing is said. They just sort of stare at each other for a moment. And then it appears that the pendant, Liko's pendant that her grandmother gave her, it seems that is this Pokemon. Because when it goes, uh, when it disappears, it disappears into the pendant and goes back to Liko. So there's definitely going to be something going on with this pendant. Uh, obviously, the, the episode's called The Pendant of Beginnings. It was very prominent in all of the promotional material, so we know it's got something to do. Just as this baby turtle crystal Pokemon thing disappears and becomes the pendant again, all of a sudden, Liko and Sprigatito are falling. These two fall a lot. I wonder if that's going to be a reoccurring theme in this series, uh, or if it's just situational. But uh, they, they fall again. And yet again, our mysterious Charizard riding savior swoops in at the last second, and bails. He grabs her, Charizard grabs Sprigatito and Liko in their arms, and they are off. Now, this is where we find out the name of the, I guess, the main villain in that last episode. He's the character with the black and white hair. He's the one who had the ride on and the Cerule Edge. His name is Amethio, or Amethio. It's probably Amethio. His name's Amethio, uh, and we do find out the name of his group as well. We'll get to that a little bit later. I kind of want to go in chronological order and not, not spoil anything out of order. Um, so we find out his name, and then something really cool happens. They have got, so Amethio and his two colleagues or his two underlings, uh, they've got some Super Sentai Power Ranger, Super Saiyan Man uh, type watches. They all touch this watch and all of a sudden they transform from the suits they were wearing down into just active wear, a group active wear. And the transformation, it seems like it, when they transform into the, the I guess the non-suits, the the uniforms, that's going to be our first look at what this new villain group is going to be. When they do transform, they go into a, you know, it's probably just going to be easier if I put an image up to what it looks like, uh, but it also has a little bit of a symbol. Now, this symbol is going to be a bit of a black and gray E on top of a black diamond shape. You see it with a little bit of a star next to it, and the E makes sense later when we realize what this group is called. We're not done though. As Liko's getting flown off to safety, Amethio or Amethio, you know, I'm gonna go with Amethio, 100% locking it in, it's Amethio. Uh, they, and his two colleagues pull out their own Pokemon. Amethio pulls out a Corviknight, 
So that brings his total Pokemon count up to three now. So we've got Rhydon, Cerule Edge, who is without a doubt his MVP. He is a tough boy. He has another battle later on in this episode, and it is insane. Um, he brings out a Corviknight, and his two colleagues bring out Skarmory, and they are chasing down Charizard and Liko. Liko, Sprigatito, Charizard, and the Charizard Rider are flying for a little bit. And then something really cool appears. They're approaching what seems to be an airship, a, an air pirate ship was my first assumption. And it's really, really reminiscent of the airships in Final Fantasy XII. That was the first thing that I thought of. Um, and it's just really, really cool. As we're approaching, you see that the wings of this ship have the pattern of a of a, a Pokemon battlefield. And later on, you're going to see that's exactly what it is. These wings can retract and create a field. Um, and a landing zone for the Charizard. What's also interesting is they seem to have force field technology on the ship, because as Charizard and our heroes are coming in, you see them phase through this sort of green shimmering force field. Um, again, this is later confirmed, uh, but I'll get to that in just a moment. We also get a name for the airship, which is really cool. I wasn't sure if we were going to get it, but they have named it the Brave Asagi. I couldn't find what Asagi means. I found a couple of things referencing uh, colors and a couple of other things, but none of that really made sense in this instance. I'm not fluent or even slightly literate in Japanese, so if any of you do know what Asagi or just the phrase Brave Asagi is referenced to, make sure you let me know down below. Once Charizard has properly landed on the Brave Asagi on the wing deck, so those wings that look like they form a Pokemon battlefield, form something called the wing deck. Makes sense, they're wings, it's a deck, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they land. Instantly upon landing though, the cutest, bestest little rock ruff runs up, doesn't look like Sprigatito and that are going to get along. You know, cats, dogs. Until about three seconds later, man, these two are going to be the best friends. They're going to have a really, really cute relationship throughout this entire series. I am calling it now. Just a couple minutes after that, two new people approach. Now, these are... I'm going to... My, my assumption. So two people, a man and a woman, a giant dude and uh, a young lady ap uh, approach. My assumption, based on the appearance, again, I will hopefully have an image just here. Well, I will have an image right here. The guy looks like he is from Alola. And I'm saying that mainly because we saw some weird hairstyles in Alola. We also saw he kind of looks like he's wearing like a, a tropical shirt. So that's my assumption. I'm going to call him from Alola. It would make sense if that rock rough is his, which it is. Um, but the cool thing is I'm pretty sure he's going to be the chef. Because if you look at his haircut, at first I didn't realize it until a little bit later on in the episode, but the the pattern in his hair is a knife and fork. Calling it, he is 100% the chef of the Brave Asagi. The young lady though, she has a very apathetic look on her face. She doesn't look like she's going to be too approachable, um, but she she's wearing just a, you know, just, she's got a pink sports jacket, she's got pink hair. Uh, very, I guess, typical looking female character in an anime. Um... We get a little bit more about her as the episode goes on, but for the moment, she, does, she doesn't look too, too interesting. It's not that she doesn't look interesting, it's more that she doesn't do anything yet. We finally get the name of the man who came in and saved Liko, and his name is Freed. He seems to be the leader of this group on the Brave Asagi, and he's very, very quickly uh, getting berated by the young lady in pink hair. Uh, she asks, have you told Liko what's going on? And no, no, he hasn't. He's essentially kidnapped this school child and boy, does he pay for it. She doesn't look like someone that you're going to want to annoy because she is not going to let up. So while our hero Freed is getting yelled at by the lady in pink hair or with pink hair, uh, two new Pokemon run up. A Pormy, which is the little electric fighting type. I think it's just electric at this point because it's first stage. Pormy uh, runs up alongside a Fue Coco. And first up, as you remember from episode one, Liko is from the Poldea region, so of course she's going to recognize these Pokemon. And she asks, what? What are they doing here? You're wearing Kanto right now. Why are Poldean Pokemon here? And the answer was just a simple one. I'm fine with the answer. It's just we encountered them along, their, along our journey and they got comfortable and stayed here. They're not the only ones. We then pan over and see that there are a few other Pokemon that have just sort of joined. It, it isn't clear if these Pokemon belong to or have been caught by any of the trainers on the Brave Asagi, but they've kind of just stayed there. We've got a, uh, there was a Snow Runt from Sinnoh, or Ancient Hisui, probably just Sinnoh though. Uh, I don't think these guys are time travelers. And we also have a Noctowl and a Shuckle. 
So we got some we got some representation from everywhere. We've got some Kanto Pokemon, which we will see soon. We've got some Poldea Pokemon, some Sinnoh, and some Johto. Really cool to see. Seeing how happy and comfortable these Pokemon are, though, this this sort of encourages Liko to think, well, if they're okay here, maybe these people aren't so bad. Maybe they're not here to kidnap me and they are here to help. Maybe they are good people. Mid-thought, we do get interrupted, though. The young lady with pink hair decides to introduce herself. Her name's Molly. And the man that was with her, the giant guy, the, sh the chef, clearly the chef, his name's Murdoch. Really cool. It seems that's going to be both their names in both the Japanese and the English. So no changes there. Just like Liko seems it's going to be the same as Japanese and English as well. And Freed. Of course, Freed. In almost the same breath, Liko pans over and sees her Sprigatito playing with the Rock Ruff, with the, uh, the Pormi and the Fue Coco. And we get another one of those classic anime scenes where she goes inside of her head and she's like, Kawaii! It's so cute! Uh, and it's cool, man. I'm, she's an endearing character. I'm loving her. She's, she's going to be an amazing protagonist. And it's not fair to Roy, who's going to be our other sort of co-star, co-protagonist. Uh, he's got a lot to live up to so far. Once back in reality, though, Liko then goes to ask who these people are. Unfortunately, before she can get the question or the answers, Freed, our Charizard rider, confirms that there are three approaching hostiles, and he's pretty sure it's the three from before that attacked them back at the Indigo Academy. So as Freed goes to head into the wheelhouse to sort of take control of the ship and hopefully evade these three pursuers, he tells the Noctowl to keep an eye out, keep an eye on their six sort of thing. It makes sense, Noctowl have got really weird. As he's approaching and going to enter the wheelhouse though, he gets a bit of communication on his Rotom phone. Everybody's got a Rotom phone. It's, it's good to see. It's modern Pokemon. I love it. Uh, he gets a call from the ship's engineer, Oreo in Japanese, so O-R-I-O, -O, or Orla in English, so it'd be O-R-L-A. So far, she's my favorite. I'm loving this engineer. Uh, she's like, Freed, yo, we are about to approach this giant thunderstorm. We have to be careful. As she's relaying this information to Freed, though, we see her down in the engine room trying to supply as much power to the Brave Asagi as she can. We see she's got a car coal that's just running on a wheel. The more it runs, the more coal it's producing. As it's producing more coal, she's then shoveling all of this coal into a furnace that has got a slugma inside it, just burning all of this heat constantly. It is really, really cool to see how these Pokemon are being shown in more of a utility sense. And it's making me think there are probably hundreds. We've got over a th we've got a thousand and eight Pokemon, not including different forms now. And it just makes me think. What sort of utility could these Pokemon have on a daily life? We saw a little bit of it in Detective Pikachu. We're seeing a lot more of it now. I would really like to go in and just sort of see what sort of day-to-day -day usage a lot of these Pokemon could have. In the early games, we would see things like Machoke and fighting type Pokemon doing a lot of heavy lifting. They'd be on construction sites. Um, obviously, things like Diglett were used to create... Uh, I think we saw an episode where Diglett and Dugtrio were used to create sort of uh, runways or channels for rivers to flow through, um, redirecting rivers using that. It's really, really fascinating to think what sort of utility Pokemon could have. And also, are Pokemon paid for their work? My initial thought would be the Pokemon being employed were owned, I don't like saying owned, but captured by the workers. So maybe they're not being uh, paid. I would hope they are. I would hope they are. We're going to start a brand new charity Made a charity, an organization, fairness, fair pay for fair work for Pokemon. I think that's a good idea. Obviously, so obviously Orla or Oreo is very concerned about the thunderstorm that they're heading into. So Freed sends his Charizard down to really help out. Obviously, we've got the Slugma burning Carcoal's coal. Uh, but maybe, maybe the plan is to have Charizard use extra fire to get in there. I'm not sure. We'll see. And we will see later in the episode. As soon as we cut away... We get confirmation. It is Amethio and his two colleagues approaching from their Corviknight and the Skarmories. Now, as Amethio is approaching, we get a look at the flag of the ship. Now, the symbol of these guys, we do get the name of the crew again, a little bit later. We get the symbol of the crew on the flag on the top of the airship, and it looks a lot like the Fairy Tale Guild logo. Like, I'll put an image of both of them up uh, right here. I think I've got my camera... I, you know what? I don't even have my camera reversed, and... I'm still getting this wrong, but I'll have both up here and you'll be able to see they're very similar. They're not the same, but they are very similar. And it's nothing menacing. It's not Team Rocket. It's not Team Aqua or Magma. Uh, they're simply called the Explorers. Now that's making me think, are these guys actually the bad guys or are we sitting with the bad guys now? And they, 
that they're just trying to explore the world. So I'm, I'm excited to see what that's going to mean. If there's a deeper meaning to explore, maybe their mission mandate is to just explore the world. Uh, maybe the pendant is some way able to portal you to another dimension. I don't know. We know other dimensions exist in the Pokemon world. Maybe they're trying to explore there. Uh, or they're just trying to explore the mysteries in the Pokemon world, which is probably probably the most accurate one. They probably started with a relatively decent uh, intention, similar to how Team Galactic started. Um, they, they were just a research operation in ancient Hisui, which then sort of became a criminal mastermind organization. Could be a similar thing. After that name reveal, though, we get a quick cut to, I guess it would be, it, I don't know what the name of uh, the, the operations room, the where you fly the ship. Uh, engine operations, the, the, the brig. No, no, no. The brig's where you put bad people, uh, your prisoners. Uh, is it? I don't know. Uh, no, that's the brig. The brig's like your prison. Um, <laughs> where you're flying it. And we get introduced to the captain of the ship. And anyone that saw any promotional material for this series knows exactly who it is. We meet Captain Pikachu. A pretty tough looking Pikachu with a captain hat standing on his tail. It is cute as heck. So that's right. We may have moved on from Ash and Pikachu, but it shows Nintendo, Game Freak. Uh, is it four? No, it's not four kids. Who does the distribution? I don't know. Who does the anime distribution? Uh, Toei? No, it's not Toei. I don't know. Um, We see that they've got no intention of sort of transitioning away from Pikachu being the mascot of the series. And honestly, that's probably the right call. 25 years it's been Pikachu. We haven't seen Mario change as the mascot for Mario. We haven't seen Link change as the mascot for The Legend of Zelda. So it makes sense that he's still going to be around in some capacity. Up in the control room, and that's what I'm going to refer to as the control room, we do see another utility Pokemon, and that's a Nosepass. Nosepass is being used as the compass for the Brave Asagi. We hear Freed say, Nosepass, show us which way is north. Does a little spin, and boom! Shows us which way is north. It's so cool. I love this stuff. This is the world building of Pokemon that I love and has very rarely been explored outside of like the Pokemon Adventures manga. In the next scene, we find another Pokemon. And I wasn't a fan of this Pokemon. I've never been a fan of this Pokemon. Not that I hated it. I just didn't really like it until now. Until now. And we see an Alolan muck cowering under a table. I don't like it because it's cowering. This isn't a this isn't like a brutal thing. It just looks cute. I kind of like it. I kind of like Alolan. From this scene, we get cut to show another Pokemon on the Brave Asagi, and now it completes our Poldea trio. We say there is a Quaxly on board, running around. Obviously, they're now in the eye of a thunderstorm. They're getting thrown around. The ship's going everywhere. And this little Quaxly, he's just trying to stay afloat. He's trying to stay up on his feet, and he dives through a Pokemon door, kind of like a doggy door in our world. Um... But we don't see what happens to him after that. He just runs. Cut to the rest of Amethia or the Explorers. We cut to Amethia and his two colleagues. We don't get their name drops. I think they are noted in Bulbapedia, but at the moment they haven't been named. And they don't want to go into the thunderstorm. They do not want to follow Amethia. They do not want to follow the Brave Asagi. And Amethia is like, no, we're going. Didn't say it menacingly. He didn't threaten them. Instantly, these two are just like, yes, let's do it. So he's either really feared really respected but either way i don't think you're going to want to mess with we then see another character i'm not saying meet we see another character uh he's an old man on the brave asagi who's just walking by murdoch the big guy possibly from alola definitely a cook the owner of the rock rough uh this old man his japanese name is going to be landau or in english it'll be ludlow i kind of like landau mo i kind of like a landau more though uh and he's just going to be a fisherman that's just according to his page in Bulbapedia, uh, but he's going to be a fisher. Now, we do get confirmation that it was a force field surrounding the Brave Asagi, because we see the Corviknight and the two Skarmory bashing up against the side of it, trying to get in, and they just keep getting repelled. So it's really cool. They've actually got force field technology or repel technology. That would be cool if it's derived from a repel, which is, I know it's just a spray, but maybe if they found a way to do it, it would repel Pokemon from being able to get in. I don't think that's how it works, but hey, that could be pretty interesting. Um, the, the technology in the Pokemon world is insanely interesting. Um, I, I'd love to have just like an encyclopedia of the technology that Silphco and other places, uh, what was the one in, in Hoenn? It was Silverstone, Silverstone? No, it was, uh, why are I calling Silver? Stevenstone, his company, yeah? 
No, no. Oh, God. Yeah, Stephen Stone's company. It was his dad. I can't remember. It's been a long time since I've played Gen 3. Um, but yeah, it could be that. I'd love to just see everything that they're working on, everything that exists in that world. It would be so intriguing. It'd be so interesting. So while she didn't seem to be the most interesting character before, Molly, a pink-haired friend on the Brave Asagi, may be the toughest one. She is trying to retract the wing deck. She's like, crap, what if the explorers do break through our force field and then they're on the ship? I need to retract the wing deck. But unfortunately, the power has gone out due to the thunderstorm. So she goes out into the middle of this thunderstorm, braves the weather to try to retract it manually. Unfortunately, the force field gives in. It shatters and the explorers are now on the brave Asagi. This is obviously a pretty dramatic part of the story, but it takes a yet another very anime style uh, and decides to go to a bit of a comedic relief. We then cut to Liko cowering, hiding, waiting with some of the other innocent, innocent, I don't know why I did quote fingers, they're all innocent, the innocent Pokemon, uh, and she cuts to her head, she's like, oh my god, everything I've been through, people are chasing me down, and she's like, wait, am I the heroine of my own story? It was just, I'm like, yes, Liko, you are, you are our hero right now, you are the heroine of this story. Um, that was kind of funny. Moments, moments later, I don't know what's happened to Molly, but the explorers enter the cabin where, where Liko and all these Pokemon are. They just start berating her with questions. Why? Why'd you run from us? Where are you going? Do you think you can trust these people? And Liko's like, I don't know. I don't know. Because she doesn't. She doesn't know who any of these people are. It wasn't properly explained to her. She then goes, but I do know one thing. I can't trust you. It was cool. As soon as she said that, Sprigatito leaps into action. Sprigatito leaps at Amethio. And it was bad. It was like, it, it was cool. It was really good for about three seconds until Amethio's female colleague grabs Sprigatito by the scruff of the neck and just holds it there. It was, it was heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking to see. So Liko's like, look, I will give you the pendant. Just let Sprigatito go. So she's like, fine. Amethio gets permission to let Sprigatito go or gives the permission for uh, for his female colleague or his female underling to let it go. And then he's like, but initially we did just want the pendant. It seems you're connected to activating it though. So you're coming with us too. She she can't do anything. She, she sort of resigns to her fate and they walk her out. They're back on the wing deck. They're about to go and Bam, freed yet again with his Charizard, lands. He's like, you ain't going nowhere. He's not letting them leave. And the rematch begins. Not between Charizard and Cerule Edge, though. This time, Charizard's withdrawn. Cerule Edge is sent out. Captain Pikachu to the rescue. Reminder, Captain Pikachu in a thunderstorm. Now that is crazy. We've seen what a powered up Pikachu can do. Just look back on episode one of Pokemon 25 years ago. You saw what Pikachu did to all of those Spiro in the thunderstorm. It was insane. So, Amethio is looking down on Pikachu. He's like, you really think this, this Pikachu is going to be able to do anything against my Cerule Edge? Good luck. Pikachu then takes a page from Goku's handbook, raises his hands to the sky and starts to form a Genkidama. Maybe not really. He does start to absorb the electricity in the air though. He gets an amazing like thunder cloak, an electric cloak, and goes to launch one of the biggest vault tackles you have ever seen. It's not overly really effective. It doesn't do a lot to Cerule Edge. Cerule Edge blocks it easily, absolutely easily, but it still looked really, really cool. During this battle, we do get the name of the people that are piloting the Brave Asagi. This group that's got Freed, Murdoch, Ludlow, and Molly, and uh, Orla. Orla, I can't forget Orla, man. She's my favorite. Uh, they are called the Rising Vault Tacklers. Bit of a name, you know, bit of a big name, but that's okay. That's okay. It's a cool one. They're the good guys. We also then see Nar uh, Naruto. <laughs> We then see Pikachu take a play out of Naruto's handbook and uses a big old Kage Bushin no Jutsu and just double teams everywhere. There's a bunch of Pikachu all over the place. Again, it's not enough to deal with Cerule Edge though. Unfortunately, a passing blow from Cerule Edge hits the Brave Asagi up at the cabin where all of those Pokemon were. 
where the Noctowl was, where the the uh the snow rump was, where the shuckle was, and she gets scared. Liko gets scared, and she's like, look, let's just stop this. I don't want anyone to get hurt. And Meteor, of course, being the bad guy, was like, did you hear that? Even she's telling you to stop. As she's trying to give up those Sprigatito bursts from Liko's arms, and he's like, no, we are not giving up. Sprigatito ain't no quitter, and he goes on to launch. Actually, we don't know if it's a male or female. Sprigatito goes on to launch an unbelievably powerful leafage. It fills the entire area. Remember, there's still mostly, mostly a force field. They only broke one section to get into the Brave Asagi, and it fills up with the leafage, man. It is just overpowering. They do have to bring out their flying types, such as their Skarmories, to just wing attack or gust all of the leafage out. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, during this commotion, they're... I don't even know if turbulence is the right word, because they're in the middle of a thunderstorm, remember? But there is a huge rock on the ship, and Sprigatito is launched off the Brave Asagi, just, just falling. Not with anyone by itself. Sprigatito falls off the airship. This is when Amethio and the rest of the explorers get back on their flying type Pokemon. And for a second, you think maybe they were impressed with Sprigatito. Maybe they've gone and saved it, which they technically have until they do the old Harold Holt and just bail. And they just bail. They steal the best Poldea starter Pokemon. And that's where the episode ends. They steal the best cat. They steal little weed cat. And it's sad. Liko is beside herself. It is really, really upsetting. The next episode, obviously they're going to be in hot pursuit. They are going to be hunting it down, Amethio and the rest of the explorers, to get Sprigatito back. This, I'm assuming in the next episode, I didn't watch the trailer. I want to go in completely blind. This is where we're going to see Roy. I'm assuming the third, the second protagonist. We're going to meet him, I would assume, and he's going to help get Sprigatito back. Um, but hey, that's that's just my assumption. I don't, I don't know. It might be more clear if I watch the next week on Pokemon, but I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. Guys, this was episode two of Pokemon Horizons. It has lived up to episodes one. It's highly set expectations, and I'm still just as excited for more to come. Again, this is only the second ever episode or type review I've ever done on this channel, so let me know what you thought down below. Let me know if what, what do you think is going to happen. What do you think is going to happen with Sprigatito? I don't think it's gone forever. I have a very good feeling uh, Liko is going to get it back. But yeah, let me know your thoughts. Have a good day.